Welcome back, everyone. Our hunt for non-abelian simple groups is almost at a close. Uh, we know that A5 is a non-abelian simple group of order 60, and we claim that that's, in fact, the smallest order for which you can have a non-abelian simple group. We know that 60 is going to work. There are three other contenders, though, that we have to throw out. We've done every number from 1 through 60, and now we're left with the dreaded multiples of 12. We already took care of 12, mind you, but we're now left with 24, 36, and 48. Uh, multiples of 12 are problematic for the following reason. 12 just by itself uh, factors as 2 squared times 3. So if you're looking at Seeloff 2 subgroups, you could have 1 or 3. Uh, so, so three is a possibility. But when you're looking at Seeloff three subgroups, you could have one, two, or four. Remember, this number has to be one mod three. So four works there. So when you look at 12, um, the way that two and three interact with each other, it actually, there's possibilities where you can have multiple Seeloff subgroups, and therefore they're not necessarily normal. So we have to look for other subgroups that are going to be guaranteed to be normal. Um, of course, if other primes come into play, like 5 or 7, you can interact with those. But you'll notice that 24, 36, and 48, they all have, they all have the form where we have a power of 2, we have a power of 3, and in particular, we have at least two um, 2s, and so thus getting a multiple 12. These ones are a little bit harder because of those observations. But in this video, we're going to rule out 24, 36, and 48. Let's start with the smallest of them, 24. 24 factors as 2 cubed times 3. So if we start to try to count how many Seeloff subgroups could we have? Well, like I said a moment ago, with regard to 2, um, we could have 1 or 3. If you have 1 Seeloff 2 subgroup, it's normal. We want to find simple groups, so we're not going to do that. Um, so you could then get three. So we're going to have um, three Seeloff 2 subgroups. Okay? Uh, so that's what this observation right here is. Now, if we were considering the three groups, right, uh, because we have, we have eight, your possibilities are one, two, four, and eight. Which of these numbers are going to be one mod three? Well, you get one and four. If you had a unique Seeloff subgroup of or of just one of them, then that would be normal. So really we're in the situation where we're considering we have three subgroups of order two, and, excuse me, of order eight, and we have four subgroups of order three. And in past videos, we try to count elements um, and then show that, oh, you either counted too many elements or you have to have a unique Seeloff subgroup. Um, 24 gets a little bit more confusing in that regard. So we're going to have to take a different approach to that. Because after all, one of the things that's hard about this one is that if you look at, if you look at the, two, the Seeloff 2 subgroups, what type of groups are there of order 8? Sure, there's some abelian groups, you know, Z8, Z4 cross Z2, um, the elementary abelian group Z2 cubed, right? It could be one of those, but you also have some non-abelian groups now. You have like the dihedral group, you have the quaternion group. And so which of them, are, which one is it, right? There's five possibilities just for those. Um, and, you know, if you look at D4, for example, it has five elements of order uh, two. It's got two elements of order four. Q8 has six elements of order four, one element of order two, um, Z2 cubed has seven elements of order two. Z8, of course, has an, two elements, actually four elements of order eight and two elements of order four. Is that right? Uh, you know, and so it's like if we're trying to count elements of order two, four, and eight, it gets a lot harder because there's so many possibilities. So we can't rely necessarily on the isomorphism type of the Seeloff 2 subgroup. Uh, which we've often done with our past examples because at least one of the Seeloff subgroups was cyclic. I mean, in this situation, because of the divisor 3 here, we do know that the Seeloff 3 subgroups are going to be cyclic of order 3. So we could try to count elements there. Like, okay, um, we have four of them, right? So there's going to be four subgroups. They intersect trivially, so they each offer an element of... They offer three elements, excuse me, two elements of order 3. So we end up with 4 times 2, which is 8. So you have 8 elements there. Um, but when it comes to the remaining ones, you know, 24 take away 8 is 12. You, you might be like, oh, how can you have multiple Seeloff 2 subgroups if they're order 8? Well, their intersection could actually be quite large. Um, so it's a little bit harder counting elements. So I want to offer an alternative approach 
to dealing with 24. So what we're going to do here is we are going to take two distinct Seelof 2 subgroups. They're groups of order 8. I want you to consider their intersections. What could, their, what could they be? Um, so a very important formula that we've proven in abstract algebra 1 is the following. If I take the set HK, which remember HK, this is just the set where we take all the possible products of some H times some K, where H is in H and K is in K. Like So this is just a subset of the group. Um, there are some situations for which this itself is a group, but we don't necessarily know if that's happening here. We did prove that this set um, always satisfies this relationship here, that the cardinality of the set is equal to the fraction where we take the order of the subgroup H, times it by the order of the subgroup K, and divide that by the order of the intersection of H and K. So what we know is the following. H and K is both... Seelof two subgroups, they have order eight, so you get eight times eight, which is 64, okay? So what are the possibilities? Well, HK is a subgroup that divides, it's a subgroup of H, so the possibilities for the order of H intersect K, you're gonna get one, two, four, and eight. Well, they're distinct, so it can't be eight, right? Because uh, if H intersect K had order eight, then it would be eight, it would also be K, that would make them equal, that's not the case. Um, if your order was one, right, then we get 64 divided by one, but this is, in si this is sitting inside a group of order 24. That's too many elements, so you can't get one, right? And if you did two, then 64 divided by two is 32, which is uh, still bigger than 24. That's too many elements. So if the order of the intersection was less than two, um, that'd be too many elements. So it turns out the intersection of any two Seelof 2 subgroups has to be four in that situation. Um, and so... Start this again in three, two, one. As such, um, we know something about the size here, okay? So this intersection is exactly four. And so then when we consider the size of HK, well, sure, you're going to get 64 divided by four. That's equal to 16. That does fit inside of 24. So it's, that's not a problem here. I'm going to I'm going to change gears a little bit. I'm going to then look at H intersect K as a subgroup of H. H has order eight. Um, H intersect K has order four. So the index is two. Um, the same is also true. If you look at H intersect K as a subgroup of K, its index in K is equal to two. Now we've proven previously that every group of index two, so I should say every subgroup of index two is normal inside of that group. Therefore, H intersect K is a normal subgroup of H and is also a normal subgroup of K. I'm not saying H intersect K is a normal subgroup of G, but it is a normal subgroup in H, it's a normal subgroup in K. And so now I wanna look at the normalizer I want to look at the normalizer of H intersect K inside of G, right? Because what's the normalizer again? Uh, the normalizer is going to be the set of all elements G inside of G such that G H intersect K is equal to H intersect K G. In other words, um, the normalizer is a set of elements of the group that normalizes the, the, the group in question right here, the subgroup in question. In particular, there are some things we always know which are inside the normalizer. The normalizer always includes the group in question. It always includes uh, the center of the group because that centralizes everything, thus it normalizes everything. Um, and so typically, if there, are, if there are central elements, that means the normalizer grew. It's not just H intersect K. Um, but in general, we don't actually know what the central edge of this group looks like at the moment. But what we can say is that the normalizer is going to be the largest. It's the largest subgroup. It's the largest subgroup of G for which H intersect K is normal inside of it. 
what that means for us here is that if we find a subgroup of G, because these are both subgroups of G, if we find a subgroup of G for which H intersect K is normal in that subgroup, that means that subgroup belongs to the normalizer. So the normalizer of H intersect K contains H, it contains K, therefore it, takes, it also contains any combination of elements from H and K. In particular, the set H intersect K is inside the normalizer. As we observed earlier, the, the set, because we don't even know if it's a subgroup, the set H intersect K contains 16 elements, all right? which means that the order of the subgroup N of H intersect K is at least 16. So the order of N H intersect K here, it's at least 16. But we also know that this order by Lagrange's theorem, because this is a subgroup of G, this order divides the order of G, which is 24. All right, so we need a divisor of 24 that's at least 16, right? And the only number that's going to work by Lagrange's theorem is 24. So we actually get that the order of the normalizer is 24. That means, since the normalizer is the order 24, that means the normalizer of H intersect K is, in fact, G, which tells us that H intersect G is normal inside of G. So we found a subgroup of order 4 that's normal in G. So while we couldn't guarantee the Seeloff two subgroups were normal, the intersection of any two Seeloff's uh, two subgroups is necessarily normal inside this group. So this exercise illustrates the power of taking normalizers. Using normalizers and intersections of Seeloff subgroups can be useful to find a normal subgroup. Therefore, there is no group of order 24, which is simple. So 24 is now off our list. Let's, let's move and look at the last two here. I guess I should have 60 here. We know 60 is going to work. Um, so I'm really considering what are the numbers that don't work, but I'll put 60 back on the list, sure. We know 60 is going to work. What about 36 or 48? Let's now tackle 48, okay? 48 has the form 2 to the 4th times 3. So the same thing kind of happens here. What are our possibilities? We get that n, uh, n sub 2. How many... How many uh, two subgroups do we have? It's either one or three. If it's one, then we're not simple because we have a normal Seeloff subgroup. So it's got to be three if we're looking for a simple one. If you're looking for three, there's actually a couple more possibilities now. Divisors of 16 are two, four, eight. Uh, one, two, four, eight, and 16. Um, two doesn't work. Eight doesn't work. But you could have four. You could have 16. Having 16 is a lot. Um, you're going to figure out that doesn't work, but four is kind of in this Goldilocks zone. It's not too hot. It's not too cold. It's not too big. It's not too small. We could perhaps get away with four Seeloff three subgroups. And so by counting just elements, it's going to get problematic. Now, we could look at the normalizer of the intersection of Seeloff uh, subgroups, just like we did with 24. That same argument would work right here by changing the appropriate parts. And I'll leave it as an exercise to the viewer to do exactly that. Um, what I want to do right now is actually provide an alternative argument uh, that would then that's useful, right? So there's, you know, it's not just a one a one horse a one trick pony. I think that's the phrase goes right. There, not one maneuver takes care of all of these. These ad hoc arguments depend on the factorization. So while the previous argument does work in 48, I want to give us another argument to show why there cannot be a simple group of order 48. Like I mentioned just above, um, when we consider the Seeloff two subgroups, there's either one or three of them by the third theorem of Seeloff. Um, if it were equal to one, then this problem would be trivial because you'd have a unique normal Seeloff two subgroup. So clearly we have to consider the possibility where the number of Seeloff two subgroups is three. Okay. Now we've used Seeloff three. We've used the third Seeloff theorem so much when we do these calculations. Um, we also are using the first one a lot because we that gives us the existence of p subgroups, in particular Seeloff p subgroups. Um, number two often gets neglected here, but I should mention we're using it all the time because if we have only one Seeloff p subgroup that has to be normal. That's a consequence of the second theorem because they're conjugates of each other. Okay. Uh, so what I want to do is now consider that conjugation action, and uh, we're going to treat it much more important right now. Because we have three 
Seeloff two subgroups. G acts on the Seeloff two subgroups by conjugation. That's Seeloff second theorem. Uh, but that that action has to be non-trivial because they're all conjugates of each other. And so if we consider the conjugation action of G on the set of Seeloff two subgroups, call that X for a moment. This is a group action, and by Applying the strong Cayley's theorem, that actually provides for us a homomorphism from the group G into the symmetric group on X. But there's three Seeloff three subgroups here. And so this sub this symmetric group SX is essentially just S3 up to isomorphism. Now, this map right here cannot be trivial, right? The orbit structure cannot just be like the first subgroup the second subgroup, the third subgroup. That's an option. Not for this one, though, because they, they have to be all together. The orbit for the Seeloff subgroups is all three of them together, like so. So we don't have a trivial homomorphism. We don't have a trivial action. This tells us that the kernel of this homomorphism is not all of G. Now, let me, let me kind of give you a hint on where we're going here. If you have a group homomorphism, its kernel is always a normal subgroup. I'm trying to show that we're not simple. Every group has normal subgroups. Every one, because you have the trivial subgroup is normal and the whole group is normal. Um, so that when you're trying to show that something's not simple, you have to produce a non-trivial proper normal subgroup. Aha. Uh -huh. So I'm going to try to argue that the kernel of this homomorphism is a non-trivial proper normal subgroup. So it's proper. Right, it's not all of G. Why is it not trivial? Okay, well, like I said a moment ago, SX here is really just S3 up to isomorphism, and particularly the order of this group is six, three factorial. And so as we map, as we map G into a group of order six, the image of this group uh, has to divide six. Um, so in particular, this can't be a one-to-one -one map. If the kernel was trivial, that would mean the map is one-to-one, -one, in which case then there's an isomorphic copy of G inside of SX. But we can't isomorphically put a group of 48 inside of a group of order six. It's too small, um, the, the codomain is. Therefore, some things have to map to the same place, the pigeonhole principle here. And as such, in particular, the identity is going to, there's going to be more than one element that maps onto the identity. The kernel of this map is in fact trivial, uh, excuse me, it's non-trivial. So the kernel is not everything. It's not nothing. It's something. And so therefore the kernel of this homomorphism is a non-trivial proper normal subgroup. And hence G is not simple. I really like this argument using the group action here, um, the conjugation action of the group on its Seeloff in this case, seal off two subgroups, because you can play around with this when the index is small, like, you know, the symmetric group in general gets really, really, really big, right? But if you look at small symmetric groups, like S3 has only order six, S4 has only, S4 only has order 24. So if the number of seal off subgroups is small, you can play around with the kernel of this conjugation action, and you can make something work with that as well. So I leave it as a I leave it as an exercise to the viewer here to convince yourself you can do the same thing with 36. That if you look at the conjugation action, um, the kernel of that conjugation action has to be a proper non-trivial subgroup, which is normal, and therefore there are no subgroups of order 36 either. So that then finishes our list, right? Um, using these conjugation actions or by using normalizers, we then can take out 24, 36, and 48. And so that leaves that the only, the only order left for a non-abelian simple group is gonna be 60. I should say, we were only we're looking at possible orders less than 60. There, of course, are non-abelian simple groups of order larger than 60. Take A6, for example, its order is larger than 60. But this then proves that you cannot have a non-abelian simple group of order less than 60, for which A5 then fills the bill. The, you know, the, the, the nature abhors a vacuum, right? There's no argument that prevents 60 from working because it actually works. There is someone who took on 60. Um, now, admittedly, there's no other a non-abelian simple group of order 60 other than A5, uh, but that's not an argument we're gonna provide in this video. So this was a pretty fun journey. We hunted through and looked at every possible order, and now we can prove that there is no non-abelian simple group 
of order less than 60, 60 being obtained by the alternating group. Before we end this video, I want to present to you the following super awesome theorem that is way beyond our ability to prove with regard to what we've developed right now in this lecture series here. So this is often referred to as the odd order theorem. Um, it's due to Fett and Thompson. I hope I spelled their names correctly. Um, if not, tell me in the comments. Uh, anyways, it tells us that every finite simple non-abelian group must have even order. Uh, things like 60, which is an even number. Uh, you can't have an odd ordered simple group and be non-abelian. The only ones available are the cyclic ones of prime order. And so the fact that um, even orders are a lot harder than odds is sort of a very awesome, very curious thing. I'm presenting it on the screen right now because it's relevant to our discussion of simple non-abelian groups that we considered in the previous well, in, in this video and all the previous ones as well. I'm presenting it for its sake of appeal, but I want you to be aware that the proof of this goes way beyond the techniques we've been using with the Seeloff theorems and, and normalizers and group actions and such. It's way beyond the scope of where we are right now. So if you're a student trying to prove uh, a problem about finite, simple, non-abelian groups, uh, their non-existence or something like in a homework problem or an exam, I would highly encourage you not to use this theorem because your professor probably won't think it's very acceptable, right? I mean, it's this, it's, if I'm your professor, then I, I wouldn't let you do it because we haven't earned this one yet. Um, our mathematical theory hasn't developed this far yet. It's a cool theorem. Just want to throw it out to there and just spaz you, but be aware it's off limits when it comes to proving, you know, homework questions in like a um, undergraduate abstract algebra class or like a first year um, graduate level abstract algebra class because it's just it's it's awesome but it's just too hard for where we are where we are right now. So with that, you know, thanks to making it the end of this journey for our hunt for non-abelian simple groups. Turns out A5 was the smallest one there was. Um, if you learn things about finite simple uh, groups in this video or any of the videos in these lectures, right? Lectures 10 and 9 actually are together as a two-part lecture. If you learned anything, give those videos a like. Subscribe to the channel if you want to see uh, if you want to see more videos like this in the future. And as always, if you have any questions about anything you see in my videos, feel free to post your questions in the comments below and I'll answer them as soon as I can. Have a good day, everyone. Bye.